welcome back to memory verse time. We're going to continue working on the memory verse that we started last week, which is our new theme verse. And we found in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8. So let's say it together. And if you can remember the actions that we learned last week to go along with it, we'll do that as well. Are you ready? Here we go. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Okay, well, last week I mentioned that we were going to be using our activity sheets, our memory verse activity sheets this week. So you would have had, depending on um, your age, um, you would have had one of these sheets, or maybe you've had all of these sheets in your family that you've been able to look at. But we had some picture cards, we've got a sort of a secret code sheet, and then we've got a sheet that uh, was taking away everything but two letters of every word. So if you've done one of those sheets, we're gonna go through them all today and we're gonna use them as our practice, all right? So we're going to start with the memory verse card. So for those of you who used your memory verse cards, I hope that you had fun with those, able to put them in order and to help learn your verse. Now, look at my cards. These are not in order at all, are they? We can see all the different pictures that represent the different words in the verse. So I'm just going to click my mouse and there we go. They're all in order. So why don't we try saying it together as we look at the memory cards? Ready? Here we go. Starting at the top. I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory I will not give to another nor my praise to carved images Isaiah 42 verse 8 okay let's give it one more try and see how we do if you want you can try looking away from the screen see if you can do it without the card but let's give it a try here we go I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Isaiah 42, verse 8. All right, so if these were the cards that you had this week, and even if you didn't, uh, the email that was sent out has all of these sheets. So if you tried one of these sheets and you want to do another one, just ask your mom or dad to print them off for you. But you can practice this week putting them in order and then practice flipping them over one at a time to take the words away. And that's a fun game that will help you as you continue to memorize. All right, we're gonna to move to the next one. So the next sheet, for those of you who did this sheet, this was a review sheet that's sort of like a secret code. So we've got a number of letters that are missing and you had to figure out what letters were missing based on the little pictures that were below. So I'm going to show you my version here on the screen. So this is what you were given. You were given this sheet with a bunch of letters missing. So can you tell me what letters were missing? What's the first letter that was missing that you noticed? I noticed that there was an apple under quite a few of the pictures and apple starts with A. So we have A, so if we put all the A's back in there, we're almost there. And then what was missing next? We've got some other ones missing. We've got two different letters. There's one of one letter and then there's quite a few of another. We had a picture of a camel and a picture of a door. So there were D's missing and there were C's missing. So here we go. So hopefully you were able to fill in all those and you got our verse. So let's say it together, ready? I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Isaiah 42 verse eight. All right. If you were one of the people that did this verse, did this sheet this week, I want you to close your eyes and we're gonna try it again, ready? So close your eyes or turn around, no peeking. Here we go. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. 
Isaiah 42, 8. Okay, good job. Now, finally, if you did this memory verse review sheet, this was kind of, it wasn't tough, but it was a little bit time consuming. What, what you had to do was you had to just write the first two letters of every word and then use those to remind you of the words. So this is what it would have looked like. You can see at the, in the middle there, they've got the whole verse, Isaiah 42, verse 8. But then, so here's the whole verse, Isaiah 42, verse 8. But then they had to take away the first two letters of every word. So this is what they were left with. So now it looks a little bit like gobbledygook, like nonsense, doesn't it? But those, those two letters of every word are supposed to help you remember what the word is. So if you did this one, let's try it. Let's see if we can say this verse just by looking at what's left on the screen. Okay, here we go. Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Good. It's almost a little bit more tricky doing it that way, isn't it? So why don't we try the same thing? Let's turn around or close our eyes so you're not looking at the screen and let's give it another try. Ready? Isaiah 42 verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. All right. Well, that was a good job. I hope that you all enjoyed using the activity sheets this week and then being able to use them again today. Why don't we give it one more shot and let's use our actions again this week before we say goodbye. All right, here we go. Isaiah 42 verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. All right, great job. Well, we'll see you next time and we'll do some more memory work together. See you. The song that we're going to sing now is called Glory to His Name. And we're going to sing the first verse and the third verse and the chorus through two times. So let's sing together. Good morning, welcome to Sunday School. We've been learning about a time in Israel's history when because of their sin and disobedience to God, the kingdom of Israel, which once was united under David and Solomon, now is divided. And the northern part of the kingdom is now called Israel, and the southern part of the kingdom is called Judah. Today we're going to talk about that northern kingdom of Israel and something happened during that time. There was a time span of over 250 years when that kingdom was divided. And during those 250 years, 
In the northern kingdom of Israel, they had 19 different kings. And of those 19 different kings, not even one of them followed God. Not one. All of them did what was evil. Now, God sent to the people over and over again, prophet after prophet, who preached to them and called them to return to him. And one of those prophets that God used during that time was a man called Amos. Now, Amos wrote one of the books of the minor prophets, and Amos was a shepherd. So he took care of sheep, but he also was a fig farmer. Now say that five times fast, fig farmer, okay? So some of you may not know what a fig is. This fruit is a fig. Mine's kind of frosty because I had it in the, in the freezer, but how many of you have ever had a fig? They're really pretty. I didn't cut this one open, but they're kind of like pinkish, purpley on the inside. Really yummy. And here, some people dry figs, can eat them dried. You can kind of see all the little seeds inside of it. And if you haven't ever had a, a fresh fig or a dried fig, you may have had figs one other way. And that is the classic Fig Newton cookie. So Pastor Cyril likes these. He's going to get to eat the leftovers after Sunday school today. So Amos was a fig farmer. Now, interesting thing about Amos was that he lived in the southern part in the kingdom of Judah, but he prophesied to the northern kingdom of Israel. And he, his message to the people was that they needed to repent. They needed to turn away from their sins, turn away from their idol worship and doing their own thing and follow God, repent and follow God. But the people didn't listen. Remember, we talked about prophets and prophets had several different roles. You can see here some of the things that prophets did. One of the things prophets did was to preach and to call people to repent of their sins, to turn from their sins and turn back to, to God. Because if they didn't repent, prophets also spoke of a coming judgment that in the future, there was going to be a time of destruction that God would bring against them because of their disobedience. These were some of the things that Amos preached against. Now I want you to take your Bible and turn in it to the book of Amos. It might take you a moment to turn there. So remember, you're going to go through the books of law, then through all the books of history, then the five books of poetry where we find the Psalms. And then further on, we have the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, who wrote Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then we come to the last 12 books in the Old Testament, the Minor Prophets. The minor Prophets begin with the book of Hosea. Hosea, Joel, Amos. All right, so when you find the book of Amos, go to Amos chapter 3, and that's where we're going to begin. So in Amos chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord hath spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt. Now I'm going to stop there for a second. And let me just ask. All right, let's do some observing. Who is Amos speaking for here? Is Amos speaking for himself? Is Amos speaking for the king of Israel? No, Amos is speaking for the Lord. Notice there it says, hear this word that the Lord hath spoken. Now, Amos isn't a very long book in the Bible, but over 40 times or 40 times in this book, we come across the phrase, thus saith the Lord. Amos was speaking for God. And 
who was it that Amos was speaking to? Notice there, it says, O children of Israel, the whole family which I brought up out of the land of Egypt. God is speaking through Amos to the children of Israel. He was reminding them, he brought them up out of Egypt. Now let's keep reading on to verse 2 and find out what God's message is to Israel. Verse 2, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. So, what does God say he's going to do to Israel? He says he's going to punish them for their iniquities. What does iniquities mean? Well, here's a, a hint for you. Our, an iniquity is a sin, something that is against God's law. The Ten Commandments are just some of God's laws. If you remember when we studied the books of law, there are over 600 commandments of God in the Old Testament law uh, alone. And uh, the children of Israel, God said he was going to punish them because of their iniquities, the ways in which they had broken God's law. Now, Amos warned that God's going to punish them for their sin. I have two more questions I want you to think about. First of all, do you think that God can punish the children of Israel for their sin? Can he do it? Second question is this. Is God right to punish Israel for their sin? So can God actually do it? And is he right to do it, to punish them? Well, we know that God can punish sin. And why is that? That's because of God's attribute that he is omnipotent. God is all powerful. So God certainly can punish Israel for their sin. And we also know that God is right, or in fact, he must punish Israel for their sin because of another of his attributes. That is that God is holy. God hates sin. He cannot be in the presence of sin. So God is holy and he is just. He is right. Just like a righteous judge. Everything that God does is right. There's some other attributes as you look at that poster and you remember the things that we have learned. And that is that God is also patient and he is loving. At this time in Israel's history, God waits for 250 years warning over and over again to uh, call the people back to him. And he waits for 250 years, but finally the judgment is going to come. Do you know that uh, anyone who repents, God would forgive them. He is merciful to withhold the judgment that we deserve for our sins. He turns that away when we repent. Now, is it hard to repent? Let's think about that for a minute. I mean, God has promised that he will forgive. He's already made a way that we can be forgiven and he still be just. Why is it then that it is hard for us to repent? It's hard because we are that sinful. We are so sinful and selfish and proud that we don't want to repent. This might make more sense to you if you think about it when you, if you have a brother or a sister or maybe a friend and they, someone does something wrong toward you. And so they come to you and they say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Sometimes it might be easy to forgive them. But then, you know, there might be sometimes, especially if it's a brother or a sister, where you might be tempted to say, mm, I don't want to forgive you. 
or huh I'll forgive you if you get down on your hands and knees and beg or I'll forgive you if you do my chores for two whole weeks or I'll forgive you if you eat my vegetables at supper time. Sometimes we don't make it easy for others to say, I'm sorry. That's never the case with God. By his attributes, he is love. He is merciful. He is willing to forgive us. Now, this was the case with the Israelites. God wanted to forgive them. If he hadn't, he wouldn't have sent 17 different prophets that have recorded their words in the Old Testament for us. Five major prophets, 12 minor prophets, 17 prophets recorded in the Old Testament and waiting all that time, over 250 years, and sending all those warnings before his judgment finally came. God was very fair to the Israelites. He, in all of that, the Israelites still did not listen. They didn't listen to one of those prophets. And so finally, it was time for punishment to fall. Look in your Bible at Amos chapter 3 down in verse 10. He says, for they, the people, know not to do right, saith the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary there shall be even round about the land, and he shall bring down thy strength from thee, and thy palaces shall be spoiled. Now, what was God going to do? He was going to punish them. And how was he going to do it? It says that an adversary, that means an enemy, somebody is going to come against them. And this is what they're going to do. It says there that they're going to spoil them. They're going to rob them. They're going to take away anything of value that the people have. They're going to take anything that they wanted. And the Israelites are going to be left without their things. Now, God had already sent several disasters as a warning to the people, letting them know that judgment would come if they did not repent. But you know what? They still did not repent. I'm going to look over in chapter 4, and I'm going to read a longer section, and I want you to notice that phrase that keeps coming up. So in chapter 4, Follow along in your Bible. I'm going to start reading at verse 6 down to verse 11. And look at all the things that God sent to call the people back. And each time they wouldn't listen. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places. Yet ye have not returned unto me, said the Lord. Now it says that cleanness of teeth. Well, their teeth were clean because they didn't have any food to put into their mouth. And want of bread means a lack. They didn't have the food they needed, yet they would not return. Verse 7, Also I have withholden the rain from you, and there were yet three months to the harvest. And I caused it to rain upon one city, and caused it not to rain upon another city. On one piece was rained upon, and the piece whereon upon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. So here their, their, the rains affected their crops. It was, the crop was almost ready to harvest and no rains. Or it rained on one city and not on another city and where there was no rain it withered. So people came together into a city that did have food and the water was gone. Pick it up in verse 9. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased. The palmer worm devoured them. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. 
I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses, and I have made the stink of your camps to come up unto your nostrils. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and ye were a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. So God brought all kinds of disasters to the people. Their food, their crops, their young men, their horses, um, how their relations were with other cities. All of these ways God was using, and yet that phrase comes up over and over again. Yet you have not returned unto me. All that God had done even reminds them of the plagues in Egypt. Those were against false gods to show that God was the one true God. And yet for all of that, the people would not repent. And so God is just and his word will come to pass. Look at chapter 4 and verse 12. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. The time for judgment is going to come. Prepare to see Israel your God. So for years, they ignored God. They worshiped whomever they wanted. They did whatever they wanted. Now, the one true God is going to bring them into judgment, just like he said they would. The God that they forgot about and rejected for all those years. God was more than fair to them, he warned them over and over again. No one could say, I didn't know we were supposed to worship God and not idols. I never heard this message before. No one could say that. Finally, it did happen. That adversary, that enemy that God talked about was the nation of Assyria. And they are the ones who came and took over and spoiled the Israelites. You know, God kept his word. God always keeps his word to carry out judgment. And the Bible says that God is going to judge all men. I'm going to read you one more verse from the book of Psalm. Psalm 7 verse 11. And it says, God judgeth the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. God is a just judge, but he is angry with sinners because of the sin that they commit against him. So what can we do? We all sin and God is just to judge us all. Our sins make God angry. Now, how does that make you feel? It ought to make you feel uncomfortable at least. It might even make you feel scared. But you know what? There is an answer. There was an answer for the Israelites. And the people would not repent. Don't be like the Israelites. Instead, there is an answer. God is just and angry with our sin. He is also merciful. And he has made a way that not even one person has to remain under their sin and the punishment of God's judgment. He sent Jesus, his own son, to take our place and, and to take the punishment that we justly deserve for our sins. If we ask Jesus to forgive our sins and trust in his righteousness, nothing good that we can do to earn our salvation or to make up for the sins that we have committed. And if we have asked Jesus to forgive our sins, you know what? It's not like we can just ask Jesus to forgive our sins and then we can live any way we want. 
we can do anything we want and we can just forget about God once we've prayed a prayer and ask God to forgive our sins. No, if we understand that our sin makes us guilty before God and that Jesus paid the highest price, he died in our place, he took the punishment that we deserved, then he needs to be first place. He needs to be Lord of our life. And so that means that he's in charge. He already knows everything about each one of us. And it's true that those who do not believe in him will be judged one day. The Bible says that there in Psalm chapter 7. Only those who have called on the name of Jesus to be saved will have God's judgment turned away from them and be saved. Won't you turn from your sins today and be saved? Good morning. Well, this week is our last week that we're going to be learning about prayer. So we're going to have a little bit of a review in the form of a prayer quiz. So what you're going to need to have with you is a piece of paper and something that you can write with because someone is going to need to be the scorekeeper where you are. So if you're by yourself, you can be your own scorekeeper. If there's more than one of you, then you can pick someone to be the scorekeeper. And you're just going to take note of how many questions uh, you get right. So you can just put a little check mark. You don't have to write down any answers. You're just going to be using it to keep track of how many questions you get right. So I will give you an opportunity to just pause the video if you need to, and you can go get a piece of paper and something to write with. Okay, so everybody's got something to write with and everybody's got a scorekeeper designated or has been self-designated and we're ready to go. Let's start with our first question. So these are multiple choice. So I'm going to read the question and you have to decide if the best answer is A, B, or C. Okay. So the first question says prayer is, and here are your options. A, prayer is talking with God. Or B, prayer is telling others about God. Or C, prayer is knowing things about God. So what do you think the right answer is? Do you think it's A, B, or C? You can say it out loud if you want, or you can just keep it in your mind, but I'm gonna show you the answer and you can see if you were right. Ready? Prayer is A, talking with God. That's right, we learned that prayer is the way that we communicate with God. We talk to him just like we would talk to a friend, just like we would talk to a member of our family. And when we talk with somebody, that's how we can develop relationships and strengthen our relationships as we get to know one another. And that's the same thing with God. All right, so if you got that question right, you can give yourself a mark. And we're gonna move on to question two, you ready? It's another multiple choice. It says, we can talk to God, and here are your choices. A, anywhere, B, anytime, C, about anything or D, all of the above. So if you think that one of those is the ways that we can talk to God, you can pick A, B, or C. If you think all of them are correct, you could pick D. So everybody's got their answers. Here you go. I sort of gave it away a little bit, didn't I there? The answer is D, all of the above. When we pray, we can talk to God anywhere because he's omnipresent. We can talk to God anytime and we can talk to him about anything. Okay, so you can give yourself a mark if you pick D. All right, here's our next one. This one has a picture that goes with it. All right, remember this picture of the robot? And we've got a circle through it, like no robots. What does this robot picture remind us about prayer? Is the answer A, robots are cool. B, we need to pray from our heart and not like robots. Or C, God wants us to be like robots. 
Which answer do you think is correct? B is the correct answer. We learned that when we pray and talk to God, we're not to be like robots. And we learned that robots are pre-programmed that have words and things that they can say, but they don't have brains and they don't have hearts. And God wants us to speak from our heart and be truthful to him and not memorize or say things that we um, don't mean just because we think that maybe sounds good. Now, it's not wrong to memorize a prayer and it's not wrong to read a prayer as long as we're praying it from our heart and we mean what we're saying. So that's what that lesson was about with the robot. Just as a side note, I do think robots are cool. All right, here's the next one. Oh, this was last week. What does this genie lamp remind us about prayer? So now we have a genie lamp with the no sign. Here are your options. A, never pray with an oil lamp. Is the answer B, prayer is like making a wish. Or is the answer C, God is not a genie and prayer is not about asking him to grant our every wish. Which one do you think is correct? A, B, or C? You ready? C, that's right. We learned last week when we learned about supplication that we don't come to God expecting him to just grant our wish like a genie from Aladdin. That's not how we approach God. God is our father and he tells us that we can ask, but we need to ask with a right heart and we need to come realizing that he is sovereign and he's going to answer our prayers in the way that is best for us, whether that's a yes or a no, or sometimes it's a wait. But we never are to approach God like a genie or someone who just grants our wishes. All right. Well, now we're going to move on to the Acts letters. We've been talking about acts for the past little while, that it's a word that helps us to remember the types of prayers we can offer to God. So if you know what the A stands for, I'm gonna put it up. So you can say it out loud where you are, even if I can't hear you. Ready? What does the A stand for? Adoration. Good. So if you remembered adoration, you can give yourself a mark. And a bonus mark, if you can remember what kind of prayers are adoration prayers. Prayers that have to do with I love you prayers or worship. If you said worship or praise, those are all correct answers. All right. So do you remember what C is? How about I give you some, I'm going to give you some choices. You can tell me what the C stands for, which one. Do you think C stands for compassion? Or was the C for confession? Or was the C for computer? C is for confession, that's right. And do you remember what kind of prayer? Bonus for those who remember, what kind of prayer is a confession prayer? When we confess, we're saying what to God? Right, it's an I'm sorry prayer. So if you got the word confession right, give yourself a mark. And if you remembered that that's an I'm sorry prayer, you can give yourself another mark. Okay, T. What is T for? Is T for tremendous? Or is T for thoughtful? Or is T for thanksgiving? It's for thanksgiving. So this is an easy one. What kind of prayers are thanksgiving prayers? Those are thankful prayers or thank you prayers that we say to God, thanking him for who he is, thanking him for the blessings that he's given us and for everything that he does for us. All right, the last one starts with an S and we talked about it just a little bit ago. Does it stand for supplication? Does it stand for submission or does it stand for something else? The S stands for supplication and supplication is 
what kind of prayers? Please prayers. So those are the prayers when we ask of God for ourselves and for others. That's right. So that is the end of our quiz. So you can total up your answers and see how many that you got right. I'm sure some of you probably got all of them right. And some of them were a little tricky. So you might've got a couple of wrong, but you know what? It doesn't matter at all because the point of all of this learning about prayer was not just so that we can have knowledge in our head and say, oh, I know about prayer. I know what it is. I know what kinds of prayers there are. I know how we should pray. The point is we need to do it, don't we? So I hope that you're all encouraged now that as you pray to God, as you talk to him, that you'll remember some of the things that you can do, the ways that you can approach him. If you've got fears, if you've got requests, if you've got praise and you're happy, those are all things that you can take to God. You can do it anytime, anywhere, and about anything. And God wants you to come before him in prayer. And if you have never asked Jesus to be your savior, that's the way to do it as well, is to come to him in prayer. If you've never confessed your sins and asked Jesus to forgive your sins, then that is something you can do in prayer as well. So why don't we close with a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we've had in the past few weeks to learn about prayer, about how we can come to you, about the things that you do for us when we pray. Lord, I thank you that you're a God who hears our prayers, that you're a gracious and a good God who loves us and who answers our prayers according to your will, which is always best for us. We thank you, Lord, that when we come to you and confess our sins, that you forgive us and that you cleanse us from unrighteousness. And Lord, we praise you and we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that we are able to read your word, that we are able to come to you in prayer, and that we can have a relationship with you through the death and resurrection of Jesus as he paid for our sins. Lord, I pray for each one watching today, Lord, and I ask that you would bless them as they continue to learn about you and to grow in relationship with you. I ask these things in your son's name. Amen. See you later. This song is called Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. And we're going to sing the first verse and the last verse and the chorus through twice. So let's sing together.